away from here, just a couple of blocks down there on the uh, West Side Highway and 46th Street. So if you're uh, bored and you're in, uh, in town, go ahead and check it out. Uh, we do a lot of great stuff. Uh, one of the things we've been doing recently is uh, we've been talking a lot about the Hubble Space Telescope. It's the 25th anniversary of launching the Hubble Space Telescope. And uh, it, we had uh, uh, the opportunity uh, to create a really great uh, uh, exhibition about Hubble at 25. It's a really great exhibition. This uh, presentation I'm going to give you is uh, uh, designed as a complement of that exhibition. So if you do get a chance uh, to check out the Intrepid, definitely go to the Space Shuttle Pavilion and check out that exhibition. Uh, now, uh, I call this presentation the Focus on the Hubble. It's a challenge to improve our greatest telescope. Now, the Hubble uh, wasn't our first space telescope. Uh, it was the largest when it was launched. We have a, a couple bigger ones now, but it, it still uh, really provided some of the best data we have of any of our space telescopes. One of the main reasons for that is that it was designed from the beginning uh, to be upgraded with our space uh, shuttle that we, uh, we have uh, uh, started producing right about the same time we started working on the Hubble. But the idea for a space telescope far predates uh, the space shuttle or even our ability to get anything into space. In the 1920s, they thought of it. They knew it was going to be a good idea uh, to get a telescope above our atmosphere, because our atmosphere, as nice it is it, as it is for us, it does uh, refract or bend light as it comes through it, and that's going to make all the images you're going to get from outside of the atmosphere a little fuzzy. Uh, now, uh, they had, uh, oh, there we go. Uh, we had uh, some great ideas in 1952. This is uh, one of uh, the famous articles we like to pull out at the Intrepid, uh, written by William von Braun. Now, he's uh, a great rocket scientist, really a brilliant guy. He uh, got his uh, start working for the Germans in World War II, uh, but after World War II, we brought him over to the United States. Uh, uh, got to pick his brain about all uh, the things he was uh, going to expect to have happen in that century, and a lot of them uh, really did. Uh, now, they don't look like uh, they looked back in 1952. You're going to see a space shuttle, uh, I'm sorry, a space station in a big circle. If you've ever seen photos of the International Space Station, you know it's, it's not a circle. And uh, similarly, you have that kind of cool-looking, uh, pointy space plane. Uh, well, if you've seen the space shuttle, uh, it uh, looks a little bit differently. If you haven't seen a space shuttle, we do have one at the Intrepid right now, the uh, Enterprise, really the prototype space shuttle. Looks a little different, but the same concept. It's going to be a spacecraft that's going to uh, enter low Earth orbit, and then come back as an aircraft, and it's going to land just like an airplane. Yeah, and uh, that's the same concept. Also, in the same article, 1952, you'll see a space telescope. They still thought it was a good idea back then. Uh, now, we didn't actually get around to start building the Hubble Space Telescope. Oh, we're going upside down here. There you go. Hubble Space Telescope until 1978. Uh, so that was a while ago. That was the year I was born, too. Uh, and it's also a year before the Sony Walkman came out. Give you an idea of what technology they were working with back in uh, 1978. And that's one of the main reasons they made uh, the Hubble Space Telescope upgradable. They knew <laughs> that our technology was going to increase, and boy were they right. Uh, now, 1978 was a while ago. We wanted to get the Hubble into orbit in the uh, early 80s, really. Uh, that didn't actually happened. We had some budgetary and uh, uh, design delays. And then, of course, in 1986, we had a first uh, big tragedy with Space Shuttle when we lost uh, Space Shuttle Challenge and, our, and uh, seven of our astronauts. So we were delayed all the way until 1990, 25 years ago this month. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Uh, the launch went off perfectly. The deployment went off very well. Here it is. Uh, now, by the way, it, it's a little hard to tell the scale in this, but the Hubble Space Telescope is about the size of uh, one of those big yellow school buses. And it was deployed using the Canada Arm, or uh, more formally called the Remote Manipulation System. That's that big arm attached to the Hubble in the photo there. And that uh, deployment with, uh, went out without a hitch. Beautiful deployment. And then they started to get information back from the Hubble Space Telescope. And the photos we were getting were quite a bit fuzzier than we expected. Yeah, there was a polishing error in the mirror. Now, this mirror is a pretty big mirror, eight feet tall, taller than I am. And uh, the error is actually relatively small in comparison to that whole mirror. It's a polishing error, really a calibration error in one of the tools. And they polished the edge of the mirror a little bit too flat. And when I say a little bit, I really do mean a minuscule amount. The error was, uh, what it, it's equivalent to about 1 50th of the width of a human hair. That's, that's still going to make pretty fuzzy images, though. Kind of weird that that small, small error is going to make such a big difference. But it did. And this, let me tell you, was a huge political relations nightmare. Uh, you know, uh, political cartoonists uh, like to make fun of it a lot. Let's see if I can help you out there. 
and a little bit more stable. Yeah, I got a little flicker there, but uh, yeah, uh, the political cartoonists like to make fun of, a lot, uh, fun of it a lot, and uh, we were already having a little bit of uh, uh, public relationship issues in terms of the, the space programs here in the United States, uh, so this was not helpful. Now, scientifically, it wasn't a complete failure. Give you an idea of the difference here. This is uh, uh, two photos of a binary star. Uh, the one there on your right hand, uh, or actually I guess it's on your left hand side, is uh, is what you can get from the Earth. So it's still quite a bit fuzzier than what you get in the Hubble. You can actually tell those two stars are very distinct units uh, with the Hubble. So we're still getting a little bit of scientific in information, but nowhere near as much as we wanted. Luckily, from the very beginning of the Hubble program, we designed it to be serviced in low Earth orbit, which is pretty amazing. So it was really designed um, uh, to have the capabilities of our space shuttle program in mind. And the space shuttle uh, was easily able to get back up to low Earth orbit and service the uh, Hubble uh, with the first servicing mission in 1993. Uh, now this is a, a pretty cool one because uh, it uh, corrected that mirror error. And the main way it did that was with the corrective, corrective optic space telescope axial um, uh, replacement. Um, that's a mouthful, so uh, everybody called it CoStar, and it's a <laughs> big box you can see there being taken out of the big uh, payload bay of the space shuttle. And uh, that CoStar is uh, uh, a little box that has uh, arms in it with mirrors at the end of their arms. They swing out so they can refocus the light with the mirror error uh, coming off of that uh, main mirror into the instruments with an automatic correction. They also replaced one of the instruments on the um, Hubble Space Telescope with a built-in correction. And uh, that's important. I'm going to bring that up a little bit later on in the presentation. Uh, but the basic thing you need to know about that mission is to fix the problem. Ah, I can see the difference right here. Uh, much, much clearer after that co-star replacement and the upgrade with the uh, instrument they replaced. Uh, very uh, beautiful images are coming back, and we're getting a lot of scientific discoveries as well. Here's another great example of a before and after picture. This is a, a distant star, giving you an idea of the type of objects that the Hubble studies and the uh, uh, kind of fuzziness around it. These are uh, uh, disks of uh, dust that uh, are probably going to someday form p uh, planets, maybe uh, similar to the Earth, and it's probably what the Earth's solar system looked like before the Earth was formed. So we're learning a lot about the universe in, w in which we live, uh, even after that first uh, uh, upgrade. Uh, fortunate timing happened as well. Uh, this is a picture of Jupiter. Now, remember that uh, repair mission happened in 1993. 1994? Uh, something kind of exciting happened. A big comet crashed into Jupiter, <laughs> the Shoemaker-Levy comet, and it left these giant scars. That's a scar down in the, the kind of lower, uh, from your perspective, right-hand side of Jupiter there. And that's, uh, that's about the size of the Earth, by the way, to <laughs> give you an idea of how massive this impact was. Now, the Hubble didn't get to take a photo of that impact because uh, it was on the other side of Jupiter. Uh, we did have a, a little... Um, uh, probe out there that was actually launched by a space shuttle as well, uh, the Galileo probe that took some photos of that impact. But uh, the Hubble has uh, a bit more uh, uh, advanced equipment, so we could uh, study all the, the gases that got churned up from that impact. We're usually only able to study the surface gases of Jupiter, which, by the way, is just one huge big ball of gas. With this impact, we're able to, uh, to learn about what's underneath there, and it turns out we were wrong about some of the stuff. We thought there was uh, going to be more water under there, for instance, uh, which is kind of interesting. It's always fun when scientists uh, have predictions that, that uh, they get wrong, but it's also fun when they have predictions that go right. Uh, this is uh, something that doesn't look like much to, to someone who doesn't uh, know a lot about astronomy, but this is a... Is a uh, uh, a galaxy, and you can see how fast it's uh, spinning around the galactic core with this photo. And this uh, uh, proves something that Einstein predicted with his general theory of relativity, uh, that there should be a, a supermassive black hole at the center of every galaxy, which uh, is pretty cool. Uh, and, uh, well, uh, we also get some uh, really cool photos back, like uh, the Eta Carina, give you another idea of the type of uh, objects we're studying at this time. Uh, and Eta Carina is a uh, star that has outbursts. And uh, uh, the biggest outburst uh, we've seen with Eta Carina happened back in the 19th century. Uh, in the middle of the 19th century, it had a big outburst. And uh, you can only see this, by the way, from the southern hemisphere, but it was the brightest star in the southern, southern hemis hemisphere. And we think it's going to explode all the way pretty soon, uh, which is going to be pretty fun. So we have a lot of uh, telescopes looking at this all the time because we want to see a big supernova uh, when um, we have uh, our modern instruments pointed at it. Uh, now, in 1997, we have our uh, second servicing mission, uh, which is a pretty good one, uh, because we're going to extend the, uh, the, the vision of Hubble from just the visible light to uh, light we can't see. 
Now, the uh, uh, visible light is uh, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It ranges uh, uh, from the, uh, the violet color to the red color. And if you go above the violet cover, uh, color, you get ultraviolet. Below the red cover, color, you get infrared. And we're able to see both of those uh, areas of the spectrum with the Hubble after this uh, upgrade mission in 1997. We're able to study things we wouldn't be able to see before, like the uh, aurora of Saturn. Uh, Saturn has aurora, similar to our aurora, borealis, aurora borealis here on Earth. Uh, it's an uh, interaction between uh, the uh, 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 electromagnetic uh, uh, field around that planet and the, uh, uh, the uh, solar winds, and that's uh, going to be pretty cool. Uh, you can only see that in infrared, though. Uh, that's not the natural color. So what they have to do is take the uh, uh, infrared image they get from Hubble and uh, choose a color and replace uh, that in uh, the, I'm sorry, this is ultraviolet, ultraviolet uh, information you're getting from Hubble with the color we can see, like this uh, particularly nice shade of blue. Uh, now we uh, are still uh, continuing to see things uh, with uh, the visible spectrum and uh, Levi Einstein, he made a lot of predictions we're able to, to see evidence of in, uh, in, with the Hubble Space Telescope. This is uh, an Einstein ring which is pretty cool. This uh, uh, kind of yellowish blob in the center here is a really big galaxy, and it's so big that it's warping space around it, like Einstein's uh, theory of re relativity predicted, and uh, that uh, blue circle around it, that's a galaxy, or the light from a galaxy, that's almost directly behind that galaxy in front of it, and uh, the only reason we're able to see it is because the light's being warped around that galaxy in the front. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, now, in 1999, we have another servicing mission. This is 3A. Yeah, you'll see a little letter in there. This was not a planned mission. This was a bit of an emergency mission. And it was an emergency mission for uh, two reasons. Uh, one reason is that we uh, had some gyroscopes fail. Uh, to aim the Hubble Space Telescope with the precision we needed, uh, need to, to, to take good pictures, uh, we have to have uh, three gyroscopes working. And uh, we sent the Hubble up with six. So if uh, any three of those failed, we'd still be able to point it at uh, whatever we wanted to. Um, by uh, 1999, four of those had failed. So when we had two left, it was in safe mode by the time uh, uh, the space shuttle got there. And uh, to make matters worse, it was 1999. Uh, you might remember something happened in 1999. We were worried about the Y2K bug. Yeah, so we were worried about thinking it's 1900 next year. So uh, they had to replace the main computer there. Uh, they also, um, uh, actually, that's no, not this one. The next one uh, was actually the regularly serviced uh, mission, the uh, uh, 3B. And this one was pretty cool. They uh, actually replaced the solar panels, made them uh, smaller, and uh, made them more efficient, which is pretty cool. They also replaced the, uh, the cooling system uh, for the infrared camo camera, which is pretty cool. And they also replaced the, uh, the basically the big main camera uh, so we can uh, get information faster. And we were able to get much bigger images, uh, like this galaxy here. <clears throat> Pardon me, this galaxy uh, uh, was so big as far as uh, data when it came back to Earth that uh, NASA had to put a warning on uh, images like this for all the people back in 2002 uh, with their dial-up modems that this might crash your computer. So warning, it's a really big file. That's how detailed these images we're getting back from the Hubble Space Telescope is. And I always like to take a, a little side trip here to talk a little bit about Edwin Hubble. He's the guy the Hubble Space Telescope's named after, and uh, he got his uh, uh, really big name by uh, discovering that there are, are other galaxies. Kind of seems amazing uh, today, but uh, uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, people didn't think that there were other galaxies. We thought the Milky Way was it, uh, but uh, well, Edwin Hubble was taking a look at these uh, kind of spiral-shaped, what they were calling nebula at the time, and he was really like, okay, uh, these uh, are much further away than we think, and they're much, much bigger than we think, and we're realizing that these are other galaxies similar in many respects to our own. Now, this isn't our galaxy, uh, but if it were, we would be about uh, two-thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy, and uh, it's, uh, it's bright in the center because there's a lot of stars, but there's also a lot of dust in there, and when we try to look at the center of our own galaxy, a lot of that dust gets in the way. One thing infrared light is good at doing, though, is going around the dust, uh, so this is uh, a really nice image the Hubble brought back to us uh, from the center of our galaxy with that infrared capability, and that was uh, increased by the extra uh, cooling system we put on the Hubble during this last mission, which is uh, pretty cool. Uh, and you're also able to study uh, these nebula, which are big clouds of dust, which are pretty fun, uh, and uh, they kind of move throughout the galaxy, and uh, you'll see uh, uh, the stars in there have uh, these kind of bow shapes 
in front of them, kind of like the wake in a boat. And that's where you can see where the motion is going in these photos, which is kind of fun. Uh, they're what we call bow shocks, uh, which are pretty th uh, cool things to study. Uh, and this is probably the most, uh, I think, awe-inspiring photos that Hubble has uh, brought back to us. And it was brought back in this time. Uh, it is uh, the deep field image. And this is kind of a fun photo. It's uh, taken, of course, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, from Earth, the same patch of the night sky could be covered up with a pinhead from arm's length. It gives you an idea of how tiny this patch of the night sky is. And uh, uh, it looks like complete darkness from Earth, but with a very long exposure on Hubble, with a, a lot of orbits going around making the same exposure, you're able to see all these little points of light. And with three or four exceptions, uh, these points of light, they're not stars, no, no. They're entire galaxies full of uh, hundreds of billions of stars. Gives a little bit of perspective on, uh, on how, yeah, really how big and how vast our universe really is. Uh, kind of fascinating there. Uh, now, uh, we also have uh, the last servicing mission, servicing mission four. Now, this is a big one. We know it's going to be the last one. This is in um, 2009. And uh, a lot of the uh, artifacts we have at the Intrepid today as part of our uh, Hubble at 25 uh, display we have there come from this mission, which is pretty cool. And it was a pretty extensive mission because they knew it was the last one. Uh, they uh, uh, did a lot of uh, preparation work. They had to build tools. That's what's happening in the upper uh, right-hand corner here. These are, are brand new tools because they're replacing parts on the Hubble they didn't expect to replace. They didn't expect it to last this long. So they're replacing uh, instruments they didn't just uh, didn't build the tools for that have to work in space, which is a very unforgiving environment. Uh, the guy who's uh, using that tool up there, he's Mike Massimino. Uh, I'd like to give him a quick shout out. He's actually uh, a professor at Columbia now. He also comes down and helps us out uh, when he gets a chance, and he really helped us set up that display we have at the Intrepid today. Uh, he had to do a lot of rehearsal as well as his entire team that went up there on that mission, and a lot of that happened in the Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory uh, on the top left there. Uh, this is actually a pretty fun laboratory. It's basically a giant swimming pool, and uh, you get a, it, it simulate a lot of what happens at that, that microgravity environment uh, because every second you have in space is, is very precious. And I, I do have to point out, these astronauts are uh, really bold people. Uh, one of our missions at the Intrepid is really to uh, honor our heroes. And let me tell you, these guys are heroes. They're risking their lives for science when you think about it. This is 2009. By this time, we didn't just have uh, one big space disaster, but two. We lost two space shuttles. These guys are still willing to go up there to service the Hubble, make sure it, uh, we get as much great scientific information as we can out of that, uh, uh, that space telescope. And the Hubble, by the way, is further out uh, there uh, than anything else that the uh, the space shuttles were meant to, to deploy or service and uh, and it's really as far as we've been since the Apollo programs back in the, the uh, 70s so uh, these guys are really bold fellows uh, down in the, uh, the the lower left hand corner you're gonna see a, a photo of a big uh, big basically refrigerator size thing he's pulling out there uh, that's actually a box to hold co-star if you remember back in the beginning I said you had this big uh, a uh, box with these arms with mirrors in it to uh, refocus the light for the mirror error. But by uh, by this time, in 2009, we've uh, replaced all the instruments with that built-in correction. So we didn't need CoStar anymore. They took it back to Earth. It's actually at the uh, Smithsonian uh, uh, Air and Space Museum uh, today. So that's pretty good. If you ever happen to be in the Washington area, definitely check that out. Uh, another thing I like to point out is uh, down on the lower left-hand side, they uh, had a rare opportunity on this particular mission because uh, there were some weather issues in both uh, Florida and California, two places they wanted to land their space shuttle, and they had uh, a rare thing on a space shuttle, that's free time. They got to hang out for a couple of days, which is always fun. And to give you an idea of uh, how, <laughs> how courageous these gentlemen are, uh, while they were, uh, you know, passing the time, they decided to watch a movie, and the movie they chose was Apollo 13, a movie. <laughs> if you haven't seen it, it's about a big space disaster. <laughs> give you an idea. How, uh, how uh, <laughs> courageous these guys are. And uh, they did a lot of really great work up there. Uh, made sure it was going to last as long as possible. And you can see the, they upgraded the main camera. And you can see the difference uh, from the earlier photos to the, the ones after this uh, last upgrade mission. You get a lot more detail. This is the... Um, uh, the 
course had nebula here, another uh, big uh, star forming region of space. Uh, these star forming, and actually, by the way, the guy who uh, just spoke before me had this, I noticed, on the background of his uh, laptop, which is kind of cool. Uh, this is another star forming region of space. This is uh, what they uh, nicknamed Mystic Mountain. It's none, another one of these uh, nebulas. Uh, there are stars off screen, uh, basically up and to the right of this photo, that are blasting uh, solar uh, radiation at these big clouds of gas. And uh, you'll see some stars are also forming in the, the tops of the clouds, making these little jets going off to the side. A very beautiful, stunning image that we're able to bring back uh, from uh, the Hubble Space Telescope. Now, I also mentioned uh, that uh, we, uh, we often, for the Hubble Space Telescope, with the infrared and ultraviolet, take uh, the, that infrared uh, data and the ultraviolet data and, and assign different colors to those uh, different frequencies of light. We can also do that with frequencies that we can see, and that's useful for scientists because they can assign different elements to those different colors. Uh, so uh, uh, you can see, uh, for instance, if you have hydrogen is red, oxygen is uh, green, you can uh, make these different uh, uh, images that uh, will tell you a lot of information scientifically, and they, they also end up being uh, fairly pretty. This is uh, uh, the opposite end of a star's life, life cycle after a star, similar to our own sun, uh, uses up almost all of its, uh, its hydrogen gas. It uh, makes a big shell and kind of poofs out there. It's not a violent explosion. In the center, the very center there, is a white dwarf star, and you can see what the elements are around that white dwarf star because we know exactly what frequencies of light uh, they're going to give off. Uh, now, I like to pull this uh, photo up too. This is a, a pretty fun object out there in the universe. This is the remnants of a, a star that exploded all the way. And uh, we know what happened in the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, 12th century because Chinese astronomers are pretty good at writing things down. Now, astronomers all over the world saw this. You couldn't miss it. It was a star shining in the day when this thing exploded. <laughs> yeah. uh, but the Chinese astronomers are the ones who were good enough to figure out that this is actually the object. It's what we call the Crab Nebula now. And it's a really uh, stunning object in the night sky, uh, but this isn't the natural color of the Crab Nebula. This is actually uh, uh, it, uh, information that we gathered from three different space telescopes. Uh, the visible light portion of this image was gathered by uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, uh, but we also had infrared image uh, gathered by the Spitzer Space Telescope, another space telescope that uh, uh, slowly does infrared stuff, and the Chandra X-ray Telescope also brought back, mm, pardon me, a lot of great information. Uh, and that's a, so the Chandra is that uh, part in the middle, the part on the edge is really mostly the Spitzer stuff. And uh, the Hubble brings it all together. So this is the kind of uh, power you can get and uh, really great images you can get from uh, combi combining uh, information from different telescopes. Uh, now the Hubble te Space Telescope still up there. Uh, and uh, we hope it stays up there for a while longer. Uh, we're hoping at least 10 more years, but uh, well, the Hubble Space Telescope has outlived the space shuttle program. All the space shuttles are in different museums throughout the world, or really throughout the country. And we do have one, again, here in New York where I work at the Intrepid, just a few blocks away. And um, well, uh, what's the fate of the Hubble Space Telescope when it runs out of juice, when it can no longer send us back images uh, uh, for uh, any number of uh, reasons that might happen in the, uh, the distant or not so distant future. Uh, well, uh, the original plan was to have a space shuttle, grab it, take it back to Earth and put it in the Smithsonian Museum, which would have been cool. But uh, well, again, it's outlived the space shuttle program. So the last servicing mission, they put a little mount there so that a robotic probe can go out there and deorbit it safely so it doesn't land on anybody's head. It's pretty big, again, about the size of a school bus. Uh, so we want it to deorbit, uh, make it a controlled deorbit, and that will happen sometime in the future, but we're going to keep it ag again going as long as we possibly can, and hopefully that's uh, quite some time to come. I do want to point out here uh, that, oops, let's see, I am just a presenter here at the Intrepid. These are the, uh, the photo credits for the guys who are doing the real work. I'm just presenting that work, uh, again, at the Intrepid Museum just a few blocks away. And that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, and, yeah, have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of the Space Ast Festival. Thank you.